I've traveled to Egypt for a very special anniversary. In this film, I'm walking in the footsteps of the most famous archaeological discovery of all time, made exactly 100 years ago in November 1922, the sealed tomb of Tutankhamun. I'm venturing into the Valley of the Kings and deep into Tutankhamun's final resting place. No one had ever found anything like this in the Valley of Kings or frankly anywhere else. And I go to Oxford for a very special exploration of the incredible archives that meticulously record Howard Carter's exploration. That's almost ghostly, isn't it? This is a glass plate negative. This is incredible and reveal the surprising appearance of the discoveries of a century ago. And you've got Carter's notes for that moment. Yes. Heavy Come wooden on. coffin, completely covered in gold foil. Journey with me as I come face to face with Tutankhamun. The prospect of finding Tutankhamun's lost tomb certainly helped to inspire Howard Carter's main financial backer in Britain, Lord Carnarvon. This is Highclere Castle, Carnarvon's home in Hampshire. I'm meeting Fiona, Countess of Carnarvon, who looks after the family collection. He would have known this room like this, would he? It wouldn't have changed enormously. I think more tables, more candlelight. But he'd have certainly enjoyed reading the books in the library. There's six and a half thousand rather amazing books. So he was a photographer in his own right as well? He was an outstanding photographer. So even if he hadn't perhaps discovered the Tomb of Tutankhamun with Howard Carter, he would have gone down in some way in history as being an outstanding photographer. Why Egypt? Why do you think it was, was there that really grabbed his heart and mind. Do you know, I think all his family here were collectors, Dan. They all collected the best over time. And he was always looking for something which reflected the beauty of the world around, both in what he saw through the camera lens. Howard Carter and him would have been in this room together, plotting the next year. Yes, actually, probably in his study, which is now my very messy study. How did he get on with Howard Carter, because it feels like they're quite different, and yet they obviously had a very good relationship. They did, and for Howard Carter, it was so exciting because he was so down on his luck. He ended up with no job, nowhere to live, and no future. So out of that very depressing situation and trying to scrape a living, he was introduced to this aristocratic Englishman with money. Lord Carnarvon decided to take him on. He paid him a salary. He built him a house. So that all happened and he was suddenly thinking, you know, I've got a future and my achievements and my knowledge are valued. Well, so they shared a, a love of Egyptology, but they also zoned in on one particular pharaoh, didn't they? They did. I think it came down to the fact that, to start with, Carnarvon and Carter were spectators watching the American Theodore Davis work in the Valley of the Kings. And he always seemed to be having these triumphant finds. One of them was apparently the tomb of Tutankhamun, and Gaston Maspero wrote a very good paper on it. And at the end, he said somewhat portentously that he th they thought they'd found the tomb of Tutankhamun. But something in the future might prove them wrong, was sort of one of Maspero's last lines in this book. And um, Howard Carter and Lord Carnarvon both thought that actually they hadn't found the tomb of Tutankhamun. They'd found the cache, they found part of his embalming process, and this was not the tomb of a pharaoh. So it was missing. So that's why when they first got the valley, concession to the Valley of the King, and they knew that around the tomb of Ramses VI, there were workmen's huts, so no one had looked underneath. You've been through the archives, I'm sure there's a few accounts in there. What do you think it cost him, all this? His widow said that she thought he'd spent £45,000 in those terms excavating in Egypt in the lead-up to the discovery of Tutankhamun. So that's several million. I so thought it's about £20 million. £20 million. Something today. like that in today's world. I mean, it was a huge Ooh. amount of money. Finally, the fruits of all that dedication, effort and money start to pay off. To see the evidence for that, I've travelled to Oxford 
This is where all Howard Carter's notes and photographs are stored. I've come to explore a very special exhibition at the Bodleian's Western Library, Excavating the Archives. It begins with a simple note written a century ago. This is one of the most famous diary extracts in history. It's from the 4th of November 1922, and you can see the few words have been scrawled across the page, any old how, showing the excitement of the writer. That man was Howard Carter, and he writes simply, first steps of tomb found. He was usually rather meticulous at making notes, so the fact that he's just scrawled that across the page, I think really gives you an insight into his state of mind, his excitement. For years, he had dreamt of this moment. This could be the climax of his career. The next day, Carter made a more considered entry after he dug down further and discovered some absolutely vital clues. Discovered tomb under tomb of Ramesses VI. Investigated same and found seals intact. Seals intact. That phrase speaks volumes. This appeared to be an undisturbed Egyptian royal tomb. Throughout November, Carter's team cleared away the spoil, the rubble, and went ever deeper down into the earth until they came to a door, which again had its seals intact, Tutankhamun's name on it. At that point, they had to wait because the man paying for the whole thing, Lord Carnarvon, had to make his way out by boat from England. But he did finally arrive with his daughter, and on the 26th of November, the big event took place, one of the most exciting days in the history of archaeology. And Carter has made an, written an account of it here in his excavation journal. I like this in particular because it is written very, very soon after the events it's describing. So this is his first impression, a, a contemporary eye view, if you like, of what Carter was actually thinking. Carter writes the now famous sentences. They made a sort of crack in the door and he held up a candle, some rotten air escaped from the tomb and he's peering through into the darkness. Uh, there was naturally a short suspense for those present who could not see because only Carter was looking through the door. When Carnarvon said to me, can you see anything? I replied to him, yes, it is wonderful. Carter was looking in here through the entrance. If he's turned left, he'd have seen these chariot wheels that the pharaoh would have needed for his chariots in which he'd like to be depicted on. Then you get foodstuffs and clothing, all the things the pharaoh would have needed to live a, a healthy, eternal life. I'm heading back into the Valley of the Kings, following the modern road rather than Carter's donkey track. Tutankhamun grew up in the turbulent time of Pharaoh Akhenaten and Queen Nefertiti, who created a new capital away from Thebes in the Valley of the Kings, in Amarna. There's been much debate about Tutankhamun's life and death and the building of his tomb. What seems certain is that he wanted to be buried here in the Valley of the Kings, last resting place of his ancestors from Egypt's new kingdom. There's only one way into the tomb, following the same route that Carter took through the piles of rubble a century ago, down a steep shaft that leads to the outer chamber, where I'm meeting Egyptologist Alia Ishmael. I think this is one of the most exciting places on earth. You've worked in here loads. Do you still get excited when you come down here? I get excited every time I enter the tomb of Tutankhamun. This is something you never get bored of. This room, there's, there's none of the carvings or the painting that I've seen in other tombs. What, why was it this plain? We know from the nature of Tutankhamun's story that this was plain because this tomb was not finished. And the whole idea behind finished and not finished tombs is interesting because a tomb is actually never finished, but how elaborate it is, is because how long that pharaoh has survived and lived as pharaoh. The longer you live, the more impressive your tomb. Because you just keep adding chambers. Absolutely. Tutankhamun died at the age of 19, <laughs> barely ever being able to rule. 19, very young. So I guess you'd expect to have a lot longer and be able to build a much more luxurious tomb. Yes, if you lived longer, you had a greater tomb. 
when you're born, your tomb is starting to be prepared for you. So they knew that they were preparing for the afterlife. And so, depending on how long he would be alive, is how elaborate his tomb is. He died all of a sudden, and they pretty much had to finish it up quickly. So that's why there's no painting on these walls. But the room was full. The room was full of things, treasures, things that Carter actually describes as wonderful things. And the wonderful and here, things, yes. This is the room we're in right now. Isn't that amazing? Yes. And this is how he saw it. And everything is thrown and cluttered and messy. So coming in here, you would think, I mean, did people just stash things? Did they not think about putting it in order? Carter was very happy that he found all this treasure. But at the moment when he saw it, he was frightened that this would be a cachet and not actually a tomb because he wanted to find the tomb. He didn't want a cachet. So what's a cachet? A royal cachet is a place where priests would hide and stack away all the mummies, statues, treasures, everything. And they would only do that when they were scared that these would be harmed and they would do it as a form of uh, a safety. By the candlelight, it would have just been flickering. It would have been just magical. When did he start to realize that maybe he did have a tomb on his hands? Well, when you look here, you would see these statues. And when he saw those statues flanking the either side of the wall, he thought, no, I mean, these statues and their placement, there might be something beyond. that wall. So there was another moment of discovery in this story. Absolutely. Between the Guardian statues in the chamber, Carter broke down the wall. Beyond it lay what he'd been hoping for all his life, a sealed and untouched burial chamber. Initially, there were great, huge golden shrines, big golden boxes, one inside another, like Russian dolls. He removed those all carefully, and he came to this red granite sarcophagus. He knew it was Tutankhamun's because there's the cartouche, Tutankhamun's royal name, and there's his birth name, Tutankhamun there, guarded by the goddesses. This was hopefully going to be the only intact royal burial ever found in the Valley of the Kings. No one had ever found anything like this in the Valley of Kings or frankly anywhere else. Unlike the bare, unpainted antechamber, the burial chamber's walls are covered in colour. This burial chamber has some of the art that we usually associate with the burial chamber of pharaohs. We see Tutankhamun depicted all over the place. This, in fact, is I, his prime minister, and the man who very suspiciously succeeded him in power, although he didn't last very long. He's got the cheetah skin wrapped around him. He is giving life, giving new life to Tutankhamun here as a mummy. We come through here, we get Tutankhamun with his snake crown, being greeted by the goddess of the West, the goddess of the dead, basically. And here we have Tutankhamun with his car, which is sort of spiritual body double, being greeted by Osiris, Lord of the Dead, into the afterlife. Back in Oxford at the Bodleian's exhibition, the display shows how Carter's team continued to meticulously record what they found in the burial chamber. We also have an extraordinary range of photographs of the objects themselves and of the recovery taking place. They were taken by a photographer called Harry Burton, and here are prints themselves. You can see Anubis in the so-called treasury. Anubis is the jackal god. Look at that linen shawl was placed around him. thousands of years ago. I love this one here, shows those two statues, seemingly guarding the entrance to the burial chamber that lay beyond that wall. And you also get, well, posed, but you get some very interesting images of the team going about their work of excavation, breaking through a wall in this case, and lifting up one of the shrine lids there. What's striking is that none of the pictures are any of the Egyptian workers named and credited with their roles. And that's particularly odd in this portrait of this young man here, such a beautiful picture. He's been made to pose with one of the pendants 
found in the tomb of Tutankhamun. And it was only in much later life that a local man called Hussein Abd al-Razul emerged and said that he was the boy and had a role in the excavation. The exhibition is based on the remarkably detailed collection kept in Oxford's Griffith Institute, which has all Carter's materials from the dig, photographs, plans, and notes. I'm having a special private view with curator Daniela Rosano. We're starting with something very precious, an original glass plate negative made in Tutankhamun's tomb by Harry Burton. That's almost ghostly, isn't it? This is a glass plate negative, and this is how Harry Burton took most of his, of his images. So he would use that camera, put in the, the glass plate, and then take the shot. And then he developed all of them in a nearby tomb. It is estimated that altogether he developed around 3,000 of these images in his little dark room in the tomb nearby. Here we see the bottom part of the outer coffin, and then the middle coffin still covered partly covered with the shrouds. And this is the moment he's exposing the face of the king and just in the process of removing the linen. So perhaps because of the nature of it being physical, like a piece of glass, it feels to me like this is, sits alongside the actual artifacts that came out of Tutankhamun's tomb in terms of their importance historically. This is incredible. Thanks for watching this video on the History Hit YouTube channel. You can subscribe right here to make sure you don't miss any of our great films that are coming out. Or if you are a true history fan, check out our special dedicated history channel, historyhit.tv. You're going to love it.